Welcome. I am Stephanie Crosley. Um, I am one of the program managers for our Money Coach team here in Milwaukee. I've been with Secure Futures for eight years now um, and super excited. And just the work we do, we are an organization that walks our talk. And because of it, it's the impact that continues to guide me and lead the passion that I have for what we do. And then also on the call, we have okay, Kiana's gonna unmute herself shortly, but in the, in the meantime, we have Maria Fuller, who is our volunteer manager. You probably have heard from Maria first. We have Kristen Rural, she's our vice president of programs. We have Pa Vane, who is our director of volunteer programs. We lo love to add them on this slide because at some point you may be in communication with them and they are part of the team. So never think that they're spam coming from Secure Futures, okay? We also have Kiana and Andrea and I'll let them uh, intro themselves. Sorry about that. I was in the midst of letting people in when you was calling on me. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Kiana Ayala and I am one of the Money Coach Program Managers in the Milwaukee area. I've been with Secure Futures for three years now and um, I can go on and on about how great the, the work is that we do, but I want to be mindful of everyone's time. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Andrea. Hey, y'all. I am Andrea Michelle, and I am the interim program manager uh, in Racine. Um, and I actually started out as a volunteer with Secure Futures the first round um, that they debuted out in Racine. And so now I'm serving as the, the program manager out here. And I am so in love with the program. But if you're in Racine, you'll learn that about me because like it is all of that, even in, in Milwaukee, too. But I'm just saying. No pressure volunteers, no pressure. I mean, you might just become a program manager. Um, so our objective today is to make sure you all have a thorough overview and understanding of the Money Coach program, how it's ran, the curriculum, the structure, scholarship. We uh, also include some cultural sensitivity and trauma sensitivity uh, language in here, uh, just to make sure you are best prepared to go into the classroom you have all the tools you need to be successful in your role as a money coach. Feel free at any point to unmute yourself or drop a question in the chat because our goal is to make sure we can answer whatever questions you do have. So Secure Futures Overview. Secure Futures itself, nonprofit organization, our mission is to provide financial literacy uh, programs and resources um, to empower teens to make financial sound financial decisions. We offer three programs. We have our Money Sense program, which is our core program. It's the foundational with the belief that every student needs the financial basis. Um, and we cover a lot of Wisconsin, some in Illinois through our program. We've serviced Secure Futures as a whole, 100,000 students. Um, and super excited about that uh, over the years, not in one year, of course. Uh, and then we have our Money Path, which is our tech-based program. It's financial planning for young adults. Um, that's that's really becoming a, a, a one of our a huge focal point at Secure Futures. It it, it has very significant value. Uh, the cool thing about Money Coach, which you all are being a part of this semester, um, is we encompass all the programs. So as a Money Coach volunteer, you will get a taste of being um, the Money Sense curriculum, and you will have an opportunity to facilitate and um, go through the Money Path app yourself. Uh, Money Coach, again, we'll go into a little bit more detail about what the program is itself, but it, it is our more intimate program, and we stay with our students over a 10-week period to actually see uh, the change that we're uh, teaching the students. Really quickly, we have a short video from one of our former Money Coach students. I'm Daisy Fergoso. I am currently a Universal CSR at People's State Bank and a former Money Coach student with Secure Futures. My parents had some financial literacy, but they were never one to like really talk about it openly. Carmen High School offered this Money Coach program, which I was selected to be a part of. And 
Before I came into the program, I would see a dollar and I would think, what am I going to spend it on? With Money Coach and with Secure Futures, it was that push that a, a teenager needed to actually learn to save their money and, and not mess up their credit. <laughs> In our 15 years existence, we have now served close to 90,000 teens with our programs. And Daisy's one of those. The programs are provided at no cost to students, no cost to high schools. And a lot of our programming is delivered by volunteers. They're so passionate about financial literacy in teens. I can speak from experience as being a Money Coach student. I would see that within my mentors. When you have teens that are smarter spenders and better savers, they become more productive adults and our community becomes stronger for it. Having the financial literacy is important because you never know when life is gonna throw you a curveball. And I went from being at home to my mom. We had a new baby, we had cars that were breaking down. And so thankfully through Money Coach, I always knew the importance of having good credit and having a savings built. And so that was really helpful to us. And we had to find a living situation. My husband was like, well, why not just rent? And I'm like, let's not rent because we're just gonna put our money to waste. So I said, let's go buy a house. And surely enough, we got pre-approved and purchased the house within two months of that. I think that I am most proud of seeing where I am today as a homeowner, you know, as someone in the financial world. Financials are such an important part in knowing how to reach your dreams. If I was five years younger, looking at myself now, I'd probably cry from the happiness of seeing where I am. It's official. Welcome to Welcome. the Secure Futures. This morning I was voted in as a board member for Secure Futures and I'm extremely excited to finally be able to give back. There's so many more kids out there that can truly benefit from this program. When you invest in Secure Futures, you're investing in the future of the students that we serve. You're investing in the community. I'm grateful to everyone that supports this program because through this program, I have become what I like to call a success story. Yes, so as volunteers, I wanna say, first and like, our programs are strictly ran by volunteers. So before we get into all the other stuff, we cannot do this. We cannot serve 90,000, 100,000 students without you all, okay? So Money Coach, go a little bit deeper into what Money Coach looks like. So it's a 10-week financial mentorship program, um, and it's only 10 dates. Now, what you'll find is, as a coach, you'll actually be paired with at least two other coaches, Okay which means you're not committing to all 10 dates that we have. So I, I just want to go say that right away because people look at 10 dates and, and they'll get intimidated, right? So you have 10 dates, you're working um, as a part of a team, okay? What those dates consist of. So orientation, we do ask that all of our volunteers go to the orientation at their respective sites, Okay. All coaches are to go to orientation. The program manager will do a lot of the leading of that orientation, but it's our way to break the ice between the coaches and the students before we start actual program, okay? We found that relationship building, um, the trust you build with the students, they're more likely to open up, be more engaging, when they know or when they, they see a familiar face, okay? We have a total of five group sessions. Those five group sessions, we'll have our group coach lead. We'll provide the curriculum. The coach just has to prepare to lead those sessions. And those sessions encompasses things such as um, uh, managing your bank account, opening a bank account, credit, um, budgeting, saving, expense tracking, and money path. Our stakeholders... I'm a former athlete, former basketball player, 
team is so important and it is important to know who's a part of your team and what their role is, okay? Um, site partners. Our site partners are our end to every school and community-based organization. They're, our, they're in, they are an extension of us in the schools and community-based organizations. So they're doing all the communication. They're doing the recruitment of the students. They're staying in the loop of everything, making sure we have our classroom, our technology that we need, and make sure, making sure that the students get to our session on time. We have our program managers, that'd be myself, Kiana, or Andrea. Uh, we're here to support you. We're here to make this volunteer experience um, go as smoothly as possible. We don't want you to leave work and feel like you're coming to volunteer, but you're doing more work. We're, we we want it to be um, a really good experience, okay? So we'll make sure you have all the tools and resources, the printouts. Um, you'll have the students and, and, and you'll have the support. Then we have our students. Money Coach is designed for juniors and seniors in high school. Okay, that does not mean you won't go to a site and see a freshman or a sophomore um, because it depends also on the maturity and where that site is. Um, the cool thing about our the students that we work with is Money Coach is a voluntary program, which means students have to raise their hand to be a part of the program. They have to opt into the program. It is not a forced program. Um, so every student who wants to be there well, not, not every student who wants to be there because we have a cap. Um, we wish we can serve more, but every student who's there wants to be there, okay? And I want to highlight that um, because uh, if a student shows up every time and they may not be as engaging, um, they may not be as active, and you may think like, why isn't this student participating? Keep in mind that, and, and Andrea is going to cover student engagement in just a little bit, but just keep in mind that student voluntarily committed to Money Coach. Coaches, like I mentioned, you'll have a team. You don't have to worry about going into a session by yourself or you don't have to prepare for a session by yourself. You'll be uh, among at least two other uh, coaches. Um, in addition, we do want to highlight that because we have alternate weeks, we have group coaching one week, we have one-on-one -on -one coaching of, in the bye weeks. Um, it's important for um, us and it's important for our coaches. We learned this a best practice for coaches to communicate every other week. And that could be in whatever way works best for you all. So that could be a coaching phone call. It could be a virtual Teams meeting or a Google meet. Um, or if you're you're up to it, you're in the same area, uh, you want to grab coffee with your coaching team, that's perfectly fine. We just ask that you carve out 10 to 15 minutes every other week to come together and discuss how the program is going and how you can make it better based on your experience with the students you're working with. Now, that is a group coach responsibility. So if you are a group coach, emails have been going out. If you did not receive an email um, in regards to your assignment, let us know. But emails did go out between Monday and today in regards to where you where you'll you'll be matched at and what role you'll serve. Um, so, yeah, let us know. That is a group coach responsibility. Are there any questions or comments at all? Okay, well, we'll keep it moving. Well, feel free. I don't like talking to myself. Group coach. Group coach's main responsibility is... Okay, Vanessa, we'll look into that. Um, group coach's responsibility is to lead, lead the main activities and lessons. The um, we, we learned that it's less about the curriculum and more about the personality and what you bring alongside the curriculum. Um, so our group coaches are bringing that. Okay, Kay didn't either. So look into that as well, please. We'll look into that too, Kay. Um, facilitate the Stephanie, before you finish, um, yeah. the Racine coaches, I, my email is going out later this week. So these people are all Racine coaches that are oh, saying something. So I totally forgot. Yeah, we don't start until uh, the mid end of February. So it's coming okay. out, Racine people. Don't, don't worry. 
I'm glad you said that because I was nervous looking at them names. Like I didn't even see their. <laughs> okay, we're. Go I'm glad we got that squared away. So, okay, Vanessa, you'll receive those assignments um, in just a little bit. But we have you on the list. Um, <laughs> no, you're totally fine. And if you know anyone else in Racine that wants to volunteer, okay, bring them along. Um, be able as a group coach, you have to be able to break down concepts into simple terms. Remember, you're working with high school students. Um, and we're not speaking to adults. So it's so important for us to know um, our audience as a group coach. And you have to be comfortable facilitating um, to, you know, between between 10 to 20 students at a time. Um, so that's a group coach role, one-on-one uh, -on -one coach. The cool thing about one-on-one -on -one coach is we've learned that it is really about that relationship building. When I first took over the Money Coach program, we were actually giving students five, we weren't giving them. We allowed students to earn $500. And we lost more students than we've ever lost in the latter years. And a lot of that, and, and over the time we incorporated the one-on-one -on -one coaches and um, our retention has since continued to get better. So we learned that um, those fostering the meaningful and authentic relationships is so important. And that's what our students are looking for. And then, of course, the $350 is just a cherry on top. Um, as a coach, you'll be developing action plans to achieve, to help students achieve their financial uh, goals, holding students accountable. Um, students are required to track their expenses, to open up a bank account, and to have a budget. Students don't have to turn in anything to you, but when they're meeting with you one-on-one, -on -one, it's important that you're able to walk them through how do you track expenses. And if they are tracking their expenses, going over that and talking with them about um, ways they can cut back or how to get better in this um, and you know, just continuing to um, help them progress throughout the program. Group sessions are optional. Um, we do have some coaches that say, you know what, I, I don't want to miss anything, so I'm going to attend every session. That's totally fine. It's not a requirement, but you are always welcome to attend a group session. I had a, We had a coach um, a couple weeks ago in our in-person training, and she's like, can I come to a session to just, you know, look at it first? And I'm like, absolutely. If this is your first time and you want to see how a program is ran, um, you're more than welcome to attend. So Money Coach, uh, like I said, this voluntary uh, program, uh, our takeaway. So we talk to students about this during recruitment and at orientation so they understand that their commitment with them agreeing to be a part of the program is they have to track their expenses. They have to budget. They have to open up a bank account. And like I tell all students, I, I want to make sure all of our coaches are prepared to work with students um, in this way as well. We're not asking students to become ex experts in any of these areas overnight. That's what we're here for, right? So it's so important for us to continue throughout the program to encourage our students. Um, and progress is progress, okay? So whether... It's a sprint. You have students that are going to excel very fast, or if it's a baby step, as long as they're moving in the right direction, they're showing up and they're doing the work, even if they don't fully understand, it's still progress. So I, I do want to just highlight that you're going to see, like we're, as adults, we see we all work so differently, right? You're going to see that a lot in the classroom. Um, it's so important for us to remove our own expectations off um, off the table so that we are giving students a realistic experience based on where they're at. That's our motto, meeting every student where he or she is at, okay? Um, at the end of the program, so as a one-on-one -on -one coach, you're, you know, you're talking with students about their expense tracking, you're looking at their expense tracker, you're looking at their budget, and you're coaching them throughout at the end of the program. So they don't have to turn anything into you. You'll see it and you'll walk, you'll coach them over the course of time. 
At the end of the program, at our last session, students will actually upload their final expense tracker and their final budget, okay? Um, and we'll send this link over to them. You'll have this link as well in case students are like, hey, Mr. Frank, how do I upload this? You'll have, you'll be able to, um, you know, uh, send it to them so they'll, they'll be able to do it. They'll fill in their name, all this information, and then they'll upload it. Um, they can upload a Google Doc if they've been tracking it on their phone on an app. They'll be able to screenshot it and upload that. Um, but as long as they upload it, they'll get credit for it. Very self-explanatory. But if you ever get to this part and you're like, oh, I forgot what, what's going on here, let us know. Now, the buy-in, I always say this at the end of the program when I'm talking to students, the buy-in is the $350. We do allow students to earn money while in the program so that they can begin putting what's being taught into practice while they have a trusted adult um, who can assist them and correct them um, if they mess up. So we already know, we're allowing students to earn $350. Realist, I mean, ideally, we want them to save the 350 do something great with the 350 Realistically, as soon as the first deposit hit their account, it's spent. <laughs> so it's important for us to be able to talk, to be prepared to talk with them about their spending habits. Um, but we do allow students to earn uh, money throughout the program. Everything we're asking students to do, we've attached a financial incentive to it. We're asking them to show up and participate. They get paid $25 every session, or they earn that money every session. We're asking students to submit documents, uh, consent forms, open up a bank account by this date. They're earning money as soon as they complete those tasks. Uh, we're asking them to upload their expense tracker, upload their budget. They're earning money once they complete that task. We pay twice throughout the semester, uh, the midway point and at the end of the program. Um, Kiana's going to do a walkthrough um, with material in just a little bit, and she's going to show you where students can find that scholarship breakdown because, listen, if students do not email you back or text you back about what they're doing, they will definitely text you first when it comes to their money. So we want to make sure you uh, you know where to go to or where you can lead them um, when it comes to how much they're earning and when that first deposit is being made. Any questions, comments, or concerns? All right, I like this group. We're on track of ending on time. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, all right, I think I'm, is, is this where I hand it over? All right, so I'm going to hand it over now to Kiana. Yes, so. Can everyone see the Secure Futures website? Okay, I see some head nods and, and thumbs up. That's good. That's good. Okay, so um, as a volunteer and a student, you can access all the materials on the Secure Futures website. So I'm just going to briefly show um, y'all how to access it. So first, let's talk about volunteer materials. So once you're on the homepage and you hover over programs, then you'll hover over Money Coach. And as you can see, we have student materials and then coach materials or volunteer materials. Sometimes we use volunteer and coach interchangeably, just FYI, but they mean the same thing. Okay, so once you're on the Money Coach Volunteers Material page, this is all of the materials that you would need as a volunteer. Um, in our coach material section, we have a couple of handouts and activities that you would use. I want to draw y'all's attention to the coach handbook. So after today's training, I will send an electronic link to the coach handbook. You will also receive a hard copy, but this is your go-to if you have any questions or need tips or best practices when it comes to the Money Coach program. It also has um, the contact information of the coaches as well. I just briefly want to go to the second half 
of the coach handbook, which is the section or the section with the weekly guides. So for every week of the money coach program, we have a guide that kind of breaks down um, the topics that are discussed, um, the activities that relate to the topics, as well as um, the action steps. So the action steps are the items that students should be wor working on in the weeks um, between the, the group lessons and the check-ins. And they also have timestamps to kind of help guide you so you know roughly how much time you should be spending on um, the icebreakers, the activities, things of that nature. Okay. So if you are a group coach, you may have to give some Prezi presentations during the lessons and you can access them on um, our volunteer materials page. So right here, we have a section with the Prezi links. All you have to do is click on that link and it'll take you directly to whatever Prezi presentation that you'll be giving for that specific week. And then um, we also have some interactive games like Jeopardy that group coaches as well as one-on-one -on -one coaches will be doing with the students. And we have them linked up here as well. I'll just briefly show you our uh, money coach Jeopardy that we do during the final lesson and essentially have the students pick a category. They answer the questions. If they get it right, they get the dollar amount. Um, we try to make it Short, sweet, and engaging for the students. Now we got to go back. Uh, Steph mentioned earlier that the students also get to experience the Money Path app. We have some resources here as well that kind of walks you through um, how to use the app. Prior to this lesson, our volunteer manager, Maria, will send everybody a class code that you can use to create your own accounts so that way you can familiarize yourself uh, before giving that lesson. There is a um, facilitation video that goes along with that lesson and you can access it here as well. Okay. Now, to access... Student materials, again, you'll hover over programs, money coach, and then click on student materials. So this is where students will go to access their materials and it is broken down week by week. So for example, orientation, we have the uh, weekly guide that breaks down the things that are gonna be covered during orientation, as well as a link to the student enrollment packet. And this is what the program managers will review with the students during orientation. It essentially goes over the program expectations as well as the forms that they would need to complete. All of the forms are electronic and submissions go directly to us program managers. I just wanna show um, y'all quickly how to access them in case students have questions. So there are a total of three forms. We have the consent form. If students are 18 years old, they can submit their own consent form. We have the enrollment form, which we ask students to complete during orientation. It gathers demographic information, um, asks them questions about their current uh, money habits, things of that nature. And then we have the direct deposit form. As Steph mentioned, um, everyone gets paid twice over the program via direct deposit. So if they do not get this form in, y'all, they will not get paid. <laughs> so um, pretty self-explanatory to fill it out. They just provide us with their name and their account and routing number. Um, please make sure that your students are typing in this information correctly. We've had instances where students have put the wrong account number and we accidentally paid other folks and then it became a whole situation to try to retrieve the payment back. So just make sure that they are careful and mindful when filling out the direct deposit form. In addition to providing us um, the routing and account number, they will also have to submit some sort of document that verifies that information. It can be a letter from their bank. It can be a screenshot from, a screenshot from their mobile app. A lot of the information can be found there. 
As long as we're able to see the account number and routing number in full, it'll be acceptable. So they'll just let us know what type of document it is and upload it from there and then sign at the bottom. One thing that I want to note is that it is up to students where they would like to bank. Um, we do have a partnership with Educators Credit Union, and through this partnership, they allow students to open up um, non-custodial accounts, and they actually waive the fee needed in order to do so. So as you are talking to your students and they don't have a bank account currently, if they are interested in opening it with educators, just let one of the program managers know and we can connect them with our liaison over there. Um, one more thing that I want to mention is that we do not accept Cash App as an option to receive their um, their payments for the program. Um, we do have something in the coach handbook that gives y'all talking points in case students have questions as to why we don't accept these options. Uh, the thought process behind it is we really want students to work on establishing relationships with financial institutions, and that's difficult to do when you're solely using person-to-person -person apps. Um, if anything comes up, feel free to tap in the program managers. We can assist with having those dialogues with the students. And then lastly, on the student materials page, we have a breakdown of the way students earn money. So if they ever have any questions, this is a, a, a good place to refer students to. Any questions about materials, how to access them? All right. So on this slide, it's a breakdown of um, all of the weeks of the program. The weeks that are bolded are the topics for the group lessons. So again, as you can see, we alternate between group lesson, check-in, so on and so forth. We kick off the pre uh, we kick off the program with orientation, and then the first group lesson is about financial institutions. That lesson features a, a Prezi presentation. Again, you can access that on the volunteers page. And then the following week, which is a check-in week, that topic is identity theft. So during week two, the group coach has a cue to stop right at the beginning of that identity theft slide because during the small group activity, the one-on-one -on -one coaches will um, cover that. So um, I guess just for additional context, um, each one-on-one -on -one check-in starts off with a group activity that relates back to the previous group lesson. And then those activities last for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then you spend the rest of the check-in time meeting individually with your students. So for that first one-on-one -on -one check-in, you'll be discussing identity theft with the students. Week four and five is all about expense tracking and budgeting. We have a couple of activities to do with the students to kind of help them develop those habits and those skills for how to create their own budget and work on tracking their expenses. Uh, week six and seven is about having conversations with the students for what they're going to do with um, life after high school. And during these weeks, we give a demonstration of the Money Path app. So during these lessons, students will get an opportunity to use the app, create some paths. And then during week seven, when they meet individually with their coach, they're having individual conversations about the paths that they created for themselves and kind of like discussing ways that they can um, take that plan and turn it into action. Week eight is my personal favorite. It's all things credit, where we talk about uh, credit reports, credit scores, how to build credit, things of that nature. This is also another Prezi presentation that you can find on the volunteers page. Week nine, which is the final week for one-on-one -on -one check ins we have a game of Jeopardy to quiz students' um, level of understanding of the concepts covered um, during the credit lesson. And then week 10, we wrap up the program. We celebrate the students completing the program. We discuss creating a budget for that next stage in their life, whether it be college, the workforce, or high school, if they are like a sophomore or junior. 
And um, we, we bring food. We really want to celebrate the students, you know, taking advantage of the opportunity and completing the program and also encourage them to stay in contact with the organization and the coaches if they ever have any questions or in need of resources. Again, you can find weekly breakdown guides in the coach handbook that goes into specifics. But does anyone have any questions about the content that will be covered over the coach? over the course of Money Coach. Uh, no, okay, I see people shaking their heads. I have a quick question. Um, are we, oh, yes. do you recommend on the week that we are going that we either print what's gonna be discussed that day or should we take the computer um, or is that gonna be like provided there um, to go yeah. over the lesson? Yes, so the site partner will have all the hard copy materials that you would need. So you don't have to print anything. You don't have to bring anything. And site partners also provide us with tech. So there will be laptops there for you to use. And all you have to do is just go to the Secure Futures website, go to the volunteer materials page to pull up any presentations or, or games that you would need to do with the students. So in Racine, it's set up slightly different. So I typically bring my laptop. I mean, they um, and and I bring the materials. So uh, in Racine, I'll have all of that information. The hard copies I will share with you during the orientation. And obviously, you can take that with you. But I will be there with my laptop and have it set up. If you if you if you serve as a group coach or whatever, I'll be there and I'll have that available for you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, any other questions before we move on? All right. Okay, so I'm going to pass it over to Andrea so we can talk about student engagement. All right. See, I told you I served as a volunteer before I became the program manager, and I recorded this video um, when I was when I was a, a volunteer of this amazing program. Um, so, so really briefly, I just want to talk to you. Well, not briefly, because I, I think this is important. I want to talk to you about um, student engagement. Um, and so the first thing I want y'all to remember is that they're still kids. Yes, there may be some that are 18 years old, right? But for the most part, these are still kids. These are still children. They're still students. And even though they did, you know, sign up, they did opt in to be there. I just want to remind y'all, they're still students, right? And so if you've been around students, kids, you know the story, you know how that, that works, right? And to be to be frank with you, a lot of the, the students um, who opt in for this program, the thing that the site partners use to draw them in is the money part. Hey, you can get paid to be a part of this program. And thinking back to when I was 16 or 17, I would have been like, sign me up too, right? So it's important to remember that the driver, the motivation behind being in this program the number one is the money. And now a lot of them, once once you start with that, like, hey, I know y'all are here for the money, but what other reason are you here for? Then you get to their true motivations, right? You get to the heart of why they're there. And when you do that, you'll find that most of them are there because they really do want to be financially literate, right? They want to know how to manage their checking account. They want to know about spending. They want to know about um, credit. And what I have found in my experience as a volunteer and also serving as the, the program manager is that these students, and, and Kiana and Steph can probably say the same thing, some of these students are advanced in their financial literacy. And so in, in the classrooms that I've been in, we talk about taxes, we talk about stocks, we talk about 401k, we talk about all of that because we allow the students to lead the program. Yes, we have a curriculum. Yes, the curriculum is absolutely amazing and also yes, we want to prepare the students for their next step. And so not, not, not all of them are headed right to university. Some of them may take a gap year. Some of them are going into the, the army. Some of them are, are just take, not even working at all, right? So everybody has a different motivation. So when it comes to these students, y'all, it's important to really get to know them as individuals, Right. I know we can make the stereotype to say these young people are, you know, and all of that, but they're also still their own individuals. And so it's important for you to really get to know them. And and when you approach them, don't lecture them. Right. They're in school. 
They have a teacher standing in front of them who lectures them four hours if they're on a block schedule or eight hours if they're on a traditional, you know, hour block. So just talk to them, right? They get enough lecturing, they get enough teaching and, and don't criticize their decisions, right? The, the things that they share with you, try not to criticize them uh, because they're already making themselves vulnerable by opening up and sharing with you. And some of the students, I know I mentioned we talked about taxes and all of that, but some students don't have a solid financial literate background. And so they may feel you know, small or whatever, because there are some things that they don't know. So whatever you do, you know, don't don't criticize their opinions, their perspectives, like really understand where they are. It's important that when you show up for the students that you show up as your authentic self. And I know that's like a buzzword, authentic self and all of that. But it's the truth, y'all, because people, it's specifically like the the young people that I've interacted with, they know when you're being authentic with them and when you're just playing games with them, right? And nobody likes a phony. Nobody likes someone who's putting on airs. Nobody likes someone who's trying to relate to them and all of that. Just show up as you are and show up with empathy and compassion and show that you care, right? Because the truth is, just like the students sign up to volunteer to be in this program, you did too, right? You also volunteered. You're taking time out of your, your day to be there, right? So you might as well make the most of it because just like they opted in, you also opted in, right? And so it just behooves you as a volunteer to really just show up as yourself because who wants to wear a mask? I mean, I did that in my 20s. I'm, you know, I'm tired of wearing masks. That, that's that's old news. Nobody has time for that, right? So uh, when it comes to engaging with the student, trust, respect, and for the love of, of Pete and John and Jerry and Jenny, get to know their names, y'all, right? Get to know their names. It doesn't matter how difficult or complicated it is. That's the very least we can do and, and address them as such, right? And if you serve as a group coach and you notice that uh, there's a, a quiet student in, in the room, you know, it's okay to all on them every once in a while, right? To get them to engage. And uh, I don't remember if it was Steph or Kiana who said it, like someone who's not engaging regularly, it doesn't mean they're not engaged in the content or the material. They just may may not be an, an extrovert, right? Um, or they just may not have had the opportunity. And so as the coach, you can create that opportunity for them by calling on them um, and, you know, just like, hey, Monica, do you want to add something? Do you have something to say? And if they, you see, they're like, then just move on to somebody else, right? Because we also don't want to put them on the spot and make them and make them feel weird or, or awkward or um, anything like that. So, I mean, that's just the, the, the big picture of like the student engagement and like what your role is in that is to just be authentic, show up as yourself and truly get to know your students and move with, with, with empathy when it comes to engaging with them. So are there any questions about that? All right. Moving right along. Did I miss anything, Kiana and Steph? Y'all, y'all know y'all can chime in if you need to. Okay, all good there. All right. So <laughs> frustration. Um, there's probably a 70 to 90 percent chance that you're gonna be frustrated with these when you're dealing with students because you you email them, they may not respond. The due date is approaching for them to get their paperwork in. They haven't turned in anything. You're like sitting with them in the class and you're asking them questions and they may be quiet, right? Like there are times where you may get frustrated with, and, and not even necessarily frustrated with the student, but just frustrated with the situation. And I want to assure you that that is okay. It's okay for you to be frustrated. Just don't take it out on a student, right? We we just don't, we don't want to do that, right? We believe in feeling our feelings, but we don't want to direct them towards the students because it's not necessarily on the students, right? So just expect to be be frustrated. 
Use us, use me, use you, Steph, use Kiana, use us as a resource, use the site partner. If, if you can't find one of us, use the site partner as your resource and use each other as resources, right? Because if you're feeling frustrated about something, chances are someone else may also be feeling frustrated. So just keep that in mind, like use your team. This is not uh, you're not in this alone, right? You are in this as a team. So so talk to us. Let us know what it is you're experiencing. And also, you know, this is important to, to seek to understand, right? What is not just what is happening with you, but also what is happening with the student themselves. Um, just this last term, we had a volunteer who was like really frustrated with the student. She was like, she's not getting it, she's not doing it and, and all of this stuff. And so I had a conversation with her and I said, okay, well, where is this student now? Well, she ha she's in high school, but she has her own business. And so I said, okay, what you're talking to this student about is beneath her. She has her own business. So she has a solid foundation. So now if you'd like, you can ask her if it's okay for you to elevate the conversation and talk about what other investments might she want to make in her business. Talk to her about tracking her business expenses instead of talking to her about tracking her personal expenses and all of that and the, you know, the, with with small money, talk to her about a little bit more, right? And so really get to understand where she is. And the minute um, the volunteer started having that elevated conversation with the student, it, she was doing everything that the, her and the coach talked about, right? But it was just a matter of, of seeking to understand, again, not just what's happening within you, because that's important, but also what, what may be happening with the student, right? Because it, it's it's not personal. It's, it's not about you. And as I said before, remember, at the end of the day, they still babies. They still, even 18-year-olds, they still babies, right? <laughs> so any questions about managing frustration, being frustrated, who to talk to, and all of that. Okay. No, and I'm sorry, let me just, uh, just to jump in too, like just being realistic too, and I, you probably might have said this, I had to step away from my baby, um, but um, you're human. We recognize yes. you're human. We recognize that you're coming from work. You have everything else going on. You may have children, family, uh, 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 career plus and not being, you know, your own business. So we understand that if ever you get to a place where you can't show up and you can't um, separate what, you know, the outside from being in that moment, let us know. Yes. Please let us know. We, we will never force you because it's a scheduled date to go into a classroom when you can't do it. So just be completely transparent. We're understanding. We appreciate you all. Just want to put that out there. Thank yes. you, Andrea. Oh, no. Thank you for bringing it up because that's so important. It we're, we're all human and we're entitled to whatever. We're entitled to need whatever we need whenever we need it. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, and so the reason why we really focus on like this, this idea of like student engagement and managing frustration is because we did have a student who specifically wrote a letter, a thank you note that says, thank you for letting me lay my head down. And this is to one of our volunteers. You know, she said, thank you for teaching me about how to spend my money. I'm paraphrasing her, her whatever, um, you know, and, and giving me candy. But, but importantly, thank you for allowing me to lay my head down and not say anything, right? Because there are gonna be instances where you will you will have a student who will look disengaged, right? You will have a student who may lay their head down during every session. I had one of those in the first time when I volunteered out in Racine and, and on the last day, he was like, I'm so glad I came to this. I really didn't want to, but I'm so glad I came because I learned so much, right? So. Just because they're they're laying their head down and they seem disengaged and disinterested, it doesn't mean that they in fact are, right? Sometimes they need a break too. And for the most part, some of these students that that one hour they have in money coach, because we're not teaching and lecturing to them, that could be that mental break or that headspace, right? That clear headspace they need to process whatever it is that they need to process, whatever they're going through in school and outside of school, right? So when you see someone laying their head down or looking disinterested or disengaged, 
please don't take it personally. Um, this is the student because remember they still showed up, right? And so we need to give them credit for at least showing up even if they put their head down. Because again, that doesn't mean that they're not paying attention. It just means that they have their head down. We don't need to judge it or add anything to that. There's a student with their head down and that's that's how we can leave it. <laughs> now, if all students have their head down, we'll come up with a, a resolution collectively. <laughs> that's a difference there. All right. So um, we just want to play this other video because. We are, we are, Steph, Kian, and I are bought into the Money Coach program and we think it's amazing, right? And so, what our, what we're saying is biased, but we, I really want to, we really want to play this video because this is from the student's perspective, which is what we're all here for is for the students um, and what success looks like for, for her. And it'll be the same for other students and it, and it may look different. Um, so, can you please play it, Kiana? Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Mekdis Wildemariam. I was in Money Coach in 2019 um, when I was in high school, when I was a junior in high school um, in 2020, I graduated. And ever since then, I sort of been using everything that I have learned in Money Coach like for my life. I'm currently a college student. I go to UWM. Um, I'm living independently. Like I pretty much am self-sufficient. I just purchased my, what finance, like financed my car um, this year. And I'm, you know, very, very independent. And I kind of give everything that I know about money to Money Coach. And to start off, I'm going to be discussing the question, how my life or my future would have been different if I was never part of the Money Coach program alumni. And the first thing is I probably wouldn't have been independent. And that's bigger, the biggest thing for me, because now seeing myself and where I am at this age, um, a lot of people in my, like at this age, they don't really understand many things that I do, like the way I do, including investments. Um, I invest, I have started my retirement investment, like for my, with my job, 401k. I have, um, I've been trying to find a good mutual bank to sort of invest my money in. I've been looking through stocks. I have been working on my credit score. I have a really good credit score and that's why I was able to get a car. Um, I pretty much have like so much openness and like knowledge when it comes to money than I used to. And when it comes to budgeting, like I'm so good at it. I used to, when I started, you know what, for you to understand where I stand, where I started, I have to give you a background knowledge. So when I started, when I, before Money Coach, I pretty much had no understanding of money. I had a job, but I didn't have a bank account. Um, my parent and I immigrated from East Africa, Ethiopia, just a couple years ago. Didn't know anything about anything. Money is a very, very taboo thing in our culture, especially a student, a kid talking about money. That's just a no-no. I mean, even adults don't even talk about money. So for you to actively like go in class and discuss money and how to save, how to get money, that was just such a, a horrible thing to do, even like to think about. Uh, in within the culture so you know i was i think around like 15 when i got my first job but i never saw my money because my money goes directly to my parents bank account and i remember the first day when i went to money coach uh meeting they said you guys have bank accounts and i was very shocked to see people who had bank accounts because i had this initial thought that you had to be 19 to get a bank account i really i'm, I'm telling you i had no knowledge of anything and the my mentor told me like oh you know i when i talked to them they said oh no you could go here do this do this talk to them this way uh, go to this location this type of bank would accept you and they pretty much gave me a rundown of everything and that same day after school i went and opened a bank account and i said well my teacher told me to bank to open a bank account and that sort of like dismissed any concern my parent had about like what i'm doing because it was it's school it's school so they accepted it right then i opened my bank account and that started like my financial journey um then they put some money in there and ever since then every week we would learn different subjects banking different banking saving and checking had no idea what that is i never saved before i don't know what that is i never budgeted 
that day I downloaded an app. I still have an app on my phone that I downloaded it in like a couple years ago. It's associated with my bank. I have educated uh, union associated with my bank, which gives me a rundown, like a breakdown of what I spend my money on every week, every month. And I have it simply because I learned it in Money Coach and I still use it. I still, before I purchase something, I still go through the process of eliminating, is this, is this a need or is this a want? Is this, do I need this or do I want this? And I still was able to sort of select things that are very, very important to me and use it, especially now that I have, you know, um, my own sort of expenses. Should I pay for rent or should I purchase this new shoes? Like things like that, that I had a hard time sort of associating, uh, disconnecting and like working with, I was able to do that. And I, everything that I just said today, and I can talk about it for hours, was due to money coach and not and i really really want to take this opportunity to thank money coach for literally altering my future giving me this privilege like this form of privilege where i can not only know what you know what uh, about money and how to save how to budget how to sort of you know save um invest i'm able to help my parents my friends um, and everything. I mean, the first day that I moved to my apartment, I was the one that taught my roommate how to write a check. And simply because I learned it in Money Coach. And she was a couple years older than me, halfway through her nursing career, and she didn't know how to write a check. And this is all due to Money Coach. You did not just change your life that were directly in class, but you changed um, lives like my parents, my friends who have benefited because I was in Money Coach. And I want to take this opportunity to say thank you. And you did change my life. You did, you did change my future. And I'm sure you're going to change other students' future as well. Thank you. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to express my gratitude. Oops. So this was like a success story that it's like, share it with everyone, spread it to the world. But it's important to remember that, you know, any progress that's made in the in the program is still good progress, right? We, you may not have a student right away who's gonna, you know, verbalize, this was amazing and I love it and, you know, I'm gonna share it with the world. But if you notice that, you know, when you have conversations with, with the students, you notice that when you first started, they know more and they're having a, a higher level conversation. Like this student is talking about investing and, you know, and not owning, but financing a car, right? And looking into stocks and, and all of that, right? So just keep in mind that um, all progress is considered good progress, no matter how big or how small it is. Just, just take it for what it is. Progress um, is progress. Um, and so even when you're working with the students, because a lot of them, some of them may have these grandiose ideas about what the world is like, and you can help to chunk that down and ask them, okay, what's one specific thing that you're looking for? What do you want to accomplish in this program? And then, you know, work with them throughout the program um, to, to and check in with them to see how far or how close they are to to uh, accomplishing that goal. So it's important to know that everything that, that you do, it does make a difference in the lives of every student that you, you interact with and every student that you engage with. You are making a difference because you're giving them information that they didn't have before. And this is life-changing information. And even if they can't use it right now today, they will be able to use it at some point uh, in the future. And also in this video, uh, the student said something that is extremely important, which takes us to our uh, next subject of conversation is when she said that in my culture, um, talking about money is a taboo, right? And there are so many um, cultures and so many uh, groups of people where talking uh, about money and engaging in money conversations is considered a taboo. Right. And it's considered something that is not uh, culturally acceptable uh, in their in their spaces. And so I want to talk to you about the importance of we're going to talk to you about trauma sensitivity and cultural sensitivity. I'm going to start out with um, uh, trauma sensitivity first, and then Kiana is going to come back and talk to you about uh, cultural sensitivity. And the reason why we cover sensitivity and humility 
and this money coach financial literacy program is because it's important for you to understand that our beliefs, our thoughts, our ideology about money is wrapped into our culture, right? It's wrapped into our our history, our family history. And so when we have conversations about money, it's more than just about money because it's we're talking about what do we believe about money, right? What values do we we place on money, right? How do we see money in its relationship to us as individuals? And so it's extremely important that when you have these conversations, whether you're serving as the group coach, when you're talking to the big group, or whether you're serving as the one-on-one coach, it's important to keep in mind that People are coming with their own values and beliefs, and you're also coming with your own values and your own beliefs about money. And so you have to be aware and cognizant of that because you run the risk of judging or insulting people. And so when you make a comment about how they spend their money, that could be insulting to them, right? To them, to these, because again, they're still babies, they're still kids, they're still students, right? And so that could be insulting to them. And so you may think you're you're talking about money, but to them, you're talking about their values. To them, you're talking about their beliefs. To them, you're talking about their their culture and their ideology. And, 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 and some of them, their core beliefs about money, right? And so it's so important to, to keep that in mind and just recognize that, An individual's relationship with money is is so um, interconnected. It's not just one thing. Money in and of itself, even for us as adults, right? We assign value and beliefs and all of that to money. And so just just keep that in mind. And that's why we talk about this in the program. So more specifically, let's let's look at trauma sensitivity. So um, for those of you who don't know, trauma is basically in and every event um, that happens to you uh, that overwhelms your internal resources, right? Anything that happens to you that is extremely overwhelming and unpleasant, and that experience can be, it can be uh, an individual experience or it can, or something where it's interpersonal, meaning it happened to you, the person, or it can be a collective or um, interpersonal experience where it happened to to the collective and just really briefly, no matter what side of the aisle you stand on, COVID happened to all of us as a collective. And so that will be viewed as a collective trauma. Um, 9-11, that was a collective trauma, right? Anytime there's a school shooting, that's a collective trauma, right? And so trauma is any event, whether it's, it's interpersonal happens to us or it happened in our peripheral, um, that's what trauma is and it's overwhelming and we have this 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 loss of control right in in any given situation and so that's basically what trauma is there are different types of trauma uh, acute uh you know, meaning you know it just happened like one time there's the complex trauma where it's a situation where it builds you know it's multiple events specifically over time. And then there's um, historical or intergenerational trauma, trauma that's passed down through the through the generations. And so when we talk about trauma sensitivity itself, the expectation is not that y'all are going to be counselors and social workers and dealing with that. Trauma sensitivity is basically creating a safe space, right, for people to show up as themselves, That's all it is. And so we want to share this information with you so that you can keep in mind that your objective is not to pathologize anybody, to to counsel anybody, but it's just to create that safe space by not judging the way they spend their money, by not criticizing their beliefs about money, right? You're just creating that safe space for them to show up and it allows them to whatever may happen to them in the in the experience of you know being in the money coach program they can show up as themselves and they know that they won't be judged for it and so it's really a matter of looking at it from you know instead of saying well what's wrong with you or said another way in the in the context of like the money coach program why would you spend your money on that 
you know, so it's moving from what's wrong with you to what has happened to you, right? So why would you spend your money on that to, huh, what made you decide to to purchase that, right? What made you decide to make that purchase? And that's coming from a curious standpoint and not a judgmental standpoint as to why would you buy that? Right. Like what that's saying, what are you are you dumb? Are you stupid? So it's really changing your perspective from that, what's wrong with you, what to what has happened to you. And like, why why would you buy that to huh, what made you decide to to buy that? Right. And so it's it's just becoming curious. And when you do that, you create that space for the students to open up to you and share more about them and about their their experiences with money. And that way you can learn by having those open conversations, what their beliefs are. And so you'll know how to approach them uh, in the future. So um, there's two ways to create a, a trauma sensitive environment. Well, there's more than that. For the sake of, of the, the program, there's two ways that uh, you should focus on creating the, the trauma sensitive environment. The first way is, is consent. You always want to make sure that you get consent from the student before you do anything, right? So if you're, especially if you're, it's, it's a one-on-one -on -one with the student and you want to move closer to them and there's something in the way, instead of just, you know, sitting there, you'd be like, Hey, is it okay if I sit here? Can I move your backpack? Right? Because again, our values and our beliefs are not just wrapped around money, but it's also wrapped around our personal things, right? And so if you there's a backpack there, you just want to ask consent. Is it okay if I move your backpack to sit next to you, right? Like me personally, I, I like to just like put my hand on people or, you know, th just the way that I communicate. And so I'd be like, put my hair right here, you know, and they'll be like, I haven't had anybody to say no, you know, but they'll be like, or I'll be like, yeah. Just want to do this to you because it's a good job, right? So it's it's really just asking consent before you do anything and in their presence. Because remember, trauma sensitivity is creating a safe space. Consent is the first way that you create that safety between you and the student um, and their environment. And the second way that we're going to talk about is giving options. You always want to give the appearance that the student has options, right? And, and it's important that we talk about the appearance of options because, you know, we know life is sometimes you, I mean, you always have op options, but you really don't. And so it's it's like with the paperwork, right? And if the students want to get paid, they have to submit their paperwork. And especially with the enrollment form, we need to know who we're talking to. So it they really need to get that in, right? And so you can say, you know, you can submit your paperwork by the due that due due date, and you can get paid because remember the driver is money. You can get paid, or you don't have to submit the paperwork. It's your choice. Um, it's your choice. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to do anything. So when you're talking to them, give the appearance of of options. Make them think that they have choices. I do it with my kids all the time, you know. So it's like, hey, you know, come on, let let let's meet, or you know, we don't we don't have to meet. Right. Even though it's a one on one session and they really have to meet with you, it's like, oh, no, no, we don't have to meet. I'll just make sure I mark you as present, but you won't get paid because we didn't have the conversation. Right. Or something along those lines. So you want to make sure that the students understand that they have options even when they really don't. So those are two of the, the most important ways to create um, a trauma sensitive environment consent and options. And if you follow those two things, the chances of the, 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 the students experiencing a trauma response are extremely, extremely low. And so let's just really quickly talk about what, what trauma responses um, may look like. Uh, I haven't experience any any trauma responses in the classroom but it also could be because I'm an expert in this and so I see it but I don't see it but I don't I don't think he, maybe Kiana Steph can speak to this but some potential trauma responses in the classroom and the reason why we call them potential trauma responses is because the appearance of these um behaviors is not indicative of a trauma response right like some people may show up um with anxiety. Some people might be anxious, right? It has nothing to do with having a trauma response. It could just simply be their anxiety showing up. But it's a potential trauma response based on what happened before, right? The trigger 
that the thing that happened, the thing that triggered that anxiety. So um, disoriented speech or appearance, you know, if they show up at class and they look disoriented, that's a potential trauma response. And and before I go on, if if you experience any of these things in, in the classroom, in your sessions, then for what we would like for you to do is to just, you know, excuse yourself, let them know, ask for consent, you know, hey, can I walk over here for a minute? If there, you can do that and come and let, one of us know the program manager and or the site manager. Like, let us know with the expectation. It's not that y'all are going to heal the students or you, we want you to intervene. We also want you to be safe. Right. And so if you experience any of these responses, just simply excuse yourself from the situation and come and get a program manager or the site manager. So disoriented speech uh, or appearance, anxiety, uh, poor concentration, or if they seem withdraw, anger you know, sadness. And, and the truth of the matter is sometimes there are no signs, right? And so that's why it's important for you to just be aware of these responses. And if you, again, if you see any of these things happening, don't engage the student because when someone is having a trauma response, they are in fight or flight. And so their, their thoughts, their brain, the executive function, the prefrontal cortex is not working. It's offline. And so you cannot rationalize with someone who's having a trauma response. And I'm saying that because I just want to sh stress how important it is that if you encounter any of these, don't try to be the savior. You can't rationalize with them. Go get help. That's what our, the program managers and the site partners are there for. So I know I just said a lot, y'all. Any questions? <laughs> okay. All right. I think it's on you, right, Kiana? Or is it still me? Okay. Y'all, so we have arrived at the last section of this training. We're almost to the finish line, y'all. We're almost there. Um, I do want to remind everyone that we are uh, discussing topics that can be a little on the heavier side. So if you need to take a moment to yourself, if you need to turn off your camera and and gather yourself, please make sure to do so. We want to make sure that uh, everyone is taking care of themselves. Okay, so let's get a little active in the chat. Um, drop in the chat. Have you ever attended a diversity, equity, inclusion training before? No judgment. Just want to kind of get a gauge of, of people's experiences. Okay, got some yeses, got some yeses. Oh, okay. All right. A lot of people said yes. Okay. That's, that's good. Okay. So maybe y'all can help me out with this next question. What does cultural humility mean to you? Feel free to drop it in the chat. If you feel comfortable, you can unmute yourself. But if you can get a couple responses, what does cultural humility mean to you? I guess I'll be the first one to talk. Um, yeah, so uh, cultural humility to me, it's it's just being humble and being aware of different perspectives, different views. Um, and uh, I think it's, 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 for some people, it comes naturally. For some people, it's a trait that needs to be, you know, that needs a little bit more attention. But um, overall, that's that's pretty much how I, how I see it. And then also, you know, to take it a step further is, you know, taking that extra step to maybe be vulnerable. Um, and if there's a, if there's a, a, a perspective, a viewpoint or a norm um, in another culture that I'm not familiar with, you know, being, being humble enough and being vulnerable enough to, you know, go out of my comfort zone and ask the question, hey, I don't understand this, or hey, can you shed some more light on this and educate me? So, Yes, thank you for sharing. You nailed it right on the head. Um, what about cultural responsiveness? Anyone want to take a take a try at this one? What comes to mind when you hear cultural responsiveness? Okay. 
I just want to add that Vanessa in the chat said for when we were talking about cultural humility, she said it's an ongoing process of self-exploration and self-critique and honoring beliefs, customs, and values. So that's yes. Thank you for reading that, Andrea. Uh yeah, y'all, y'all pretty much nailed it on the head. You know, being culturally humble is um a lifelong process of self-reflection and and really taking a look at your own beliefs and cultural identities and then understanding that other people have their own cultural beliefs and identities. And it doesn't necessarily mean that one is better than the other or wrong. It just means that we all have lived different experiences and because of that, we have different uh, perspectives. So it's being... Um, willing to learn from others um, and also recognizing potential um, biases or unconscious stereotypes that we might have um, because of the the experiences that we we live because we 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 have limitations to knowing all of someone else's culture and upbringing and stuff like that so keeping that keeping that openness and curiosity as you are learning from others and recognizing that no one is the sole representative of the groups and the cultures that they are a part of and that we are all our own unique individuals. Okay, so we can't talk about cultural humility without talking about culture first, right? So again, let's get active in the chat. When you think of culture, what are some things that come to mind? See if we can get a couple of people to drop some ideas in the chat. When you think of culture, what comes to mind? I see, got a couple of responses. People's family experiences, yes. Yes. Customs, history, yep. Any other ideas? What comes to mind when you think of culture? Well, up on the slide, we have something called uh, the cultural iceberg, iceberg, excuse me. So when you think of an iceberg, you know, there's like a piece of ice on top above sea level. But then when you get underneath, you see this big, massive land. And, and that can be applied to culture as well. Um, some people have mentioned it, you know, food, music, the, the way someone dresses, th that is all a part of culture. Uh, but what else is part of culture is someone's concepts around time and and gender someone's communication style uh whether or not they use eye contact hand gestures their approaches to religion and interacting with adults and stuff like that so it's important to keep in mind that all of these facets shape um our our culture so Earlier, when we were talking about um, cultural humility, I had mentioned that um, sometimes we have unconscious stereotypes um, against other groups. And um, these um, unconscious stereotypes stems from biases that we may have. So biases are those like initial automatic thoughts that we get. And these are thoughts that have been ingrained in us uh, through society, through the media we consume, through the schools we went to, the ways that our family um, raised us, things of that nature. And it's important to note that even the, the biases or the stereotypes that may seem positive can also be harmful as well because they prevent us from seeing someone for who they truly are. So up on the screen is a quote from Jennifer Eberhardt, I believe is how you say their name, who is a social psychiatrist that wrote this book. And I think this quote does a really good job encompassing what it is to have bias. And um, one thing that I wanna note about biases is that everyone 
has them. It's it's the way that our brain works because we are constantly receiving information on the regular. So it's the way that we compartmentalize these ideas. But it's important to um, be be mindful when these thoughts come up. It's important to take a, a beat and pause and, and really ask yourself, where are these thoughts coming from? You know, are these thoughts that I have myself or are these thoughts that I have been taught or, or conditioned to have? Um, another thing that I want to note is that students can have biases on us as well, because um, we are essentially strangers that they are meeting for the first time. It is important to remember that we are the adults and and to try your best not to shut down or become defensive when these things happen, you know, really wanna lead by example and kind of model um, how to to engage and interact with each other despite the differences and stuff like that. So um, when you're going into the classroom, just be mindful of how you are showing up in those spaces and um, just really lead with compassion and curiosity and really um, get to learn the students for who they are. All right, so and lastly, I just want to add, you know, when we talk oh, yeah, about go ahead. Implicit, when, when we talk about implicit bias, we, we typically think, uh, you know, implicit bias as it relates to race and ethnicity, but all of us have implicit bias. Every single last one of us in this session right here, we have implicit bias. I know my, I had a bias against young people. I know why. I Every time I would see a group of young people, it could be white, black, especially, this is when malls were a thing, y'all, when going to the mall, right? Especially when my babies were younger, I'm like, oh my gosh, here, here comes these hoodlums, right? Like grabbing my kids, holding them close until one day I'm like, Andrea, what did you? These, these young people ain't even thinking about you. And then it just brought me back to my own, again, my own bias, right? The experiences that I had. And I no longer have that that bias, but all of us have some bias, right? And so when you think about bias, don't just think in terms, don't think in terms of race or ethnicity or gender, the things that are obvious. There are other biases that we can have, right? So I just want to put that out there. Yes. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, so up on the screen are some key components to keep in mind uh, when it comes to being culturally humble. Again, remembering that this is a, a process. It's ongoing. So there, there may be times where you slip up and make mistakes. It's okay. Just take it as a, a learning opportunity. So number one, we got awareness. Just building and developing that self-awareness, acknowledging that implicit biases are real. Um, and just start to observe them and be mindful of them when you you enter a room. Next up, uh, number two is attitude. So approaching new situations, uh, new people when you're working with the students with a genuine curiosity to really get to know them. Um, so be open-minded, be curious. That's the best way to, to lead and move forward. Number three is knowledge. So just exposing yourself to different groups, different cultures. And nowadays there's so many ways to go about this. You can movies, TV shows, podcasts, you can go to different events in the community, just really um, expanding your, your, your circle around you to, to expose yourself to, to new groups and new ideologies, new beliefs, things like that. Uh, number four is working on the skills, uh, the skills to challenge those automatic thoughts that you have. Um, again, just slowing down, taking a beat and really asking yourself, are these my thoughts or is this something that I learned? Where is this coming from? So kind of working to um, unlearn some of those things. And lastly, uh, you can't be culturally humble without humility. So uh, just recognizing that we are all products of our environment, um, just because we have different experiences does not invalidate them, um, regardless of how different they are and how we view the world. Um, okay. All right, so... Let's take a moment to reflect here. Again, you can use the chat or or unmute yourself. But what are some risks that can come from not 
approaching your role as a money coach volunteer with cultural humility or trauma sensitivity? Um, I, th I think one of the things um, that, that can happen if you don't do that is you can sort of lose your ability to be effective and to sort of connect with the, with the students. Um, I've seen it and done it myself. And, and you know, I, I think as in, I think the humility part really, if you're humble and you're, you're just yourself, I think that that goes a long way. The authentic, authenticity makes a big difference there. So to, to try to reconnect there. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Anyone I know. Else? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so I think too that with the trauma sensitivity, I think that because we don't know, like you stated, a lot of people come from different backgrounds and, you know, experience different things. And so it can be triggering for some for certain things. And um, I know that one of the responses for trauma is to shut down and to just, you know, want to just fight or flight mode, you know? And I, so I think that it's just important to go in with that lens, like, hey, I don't know where this, you know, what experience this person has went through in their little young life. So again, like you said, they're babies, you know, we have to be fragile and make sure that we approach it that way. So I think that's kind of what I think of for that. Thank you. Anyone else want to chime in? That's all right. All right, y'all. Well, we made it. We made it to the finish line. Woo, woo. <laughs> we forgot to tell you at the end, you have to do your favorite dance because we made it. We made it. <laughs> I'm not saying too many dances, but thanks for shaking your head, uh, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't do that. <laughs> my question is, why is everybody go to dance rubbing it like it's hot? That's a, that's my only question. You said, what happened? <laughs> I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know? <laughs> uh, just a few reminders uh, that we want to leave with y'all before we wrap up. Uh, keep an open line of communication. So if you have any questions, if you um, meet any like problems or issues or, or running late, can't make it to a session, please let your program managers know. Again, we are here to support you as a Money Coach volunteer. Um, share our posts, like our posts. Um, if you haven't followed us on LinkedIn, please do so. Um, also share a post. If you're on your way to a site, you know, you could take a quick selfie like, hey, I'm at Riverside today, you know, about to give these students a great money coach experience. You know, let the folks know that you're volunteering in the community. Uh, Maria Fuller will follow up with folks who haven't completed their volunteer application. So if you haven't heard from her, you're good. If you do get an email for her, please make sure to do that as soon as possible. Uh, for our new folks, we will be running uh, background checks. There is no action needed on your end. We're just letting you know that we're going to be running that. Um, for folks that are volunteering at an MPS location, you will need to complete um, their application and background check. Again, we will communicate this to you. Um, Andrea, do you know if folks in Racine will need to complete anything um, regarding applications or background checks? Yes. So uh, in our USD, you'll need to complete uh, an RUSD background. It is literally so simple. I think it takes you like two minutes to fill in the information and you typically hear back within 24 to 48 hours. So you will need to do a separate thing for our USD. Okay. Thank you. Um, I believe everybody on the call sent over their site selections. Thank you for that. Um, for the Milwaukee folks, as Stephanie mentioned, we did send out those matches. Andrea will be reaching out to the Racine folks uh, very soon, letting everyone know what they are matched with. And last but not least is our feedback survey. So I'm also going to drop it in the chat for folks. So in the chat, I just dropped the link. Uh, you can also use our QR code on the screen. Let us know how we did. Um, at Secure Future, we really value the input and feedback from all of our volunteers. Your input helps us improve the experience for future Money Coach programs. So let us know what we did well. Let us know what we can improve on. 
Anything else I missed, Andrea, Steph? No, I would just say it was a lot of information. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you will receive this recording. You will receive the coach handbook, as Kiana mentioned earlier, by email tomorrow, no later than Friday. Um, we do not expect you to memorize everything to prepare all lessons. You will receive an email from us one week prior with what you need to do for that following week. Okay, so it's a lot of information because we want to know up front what you're signing up for, right? But we'll make sure you're prepared or we'll give you what you need every week, okay? So just want to put that out there. I don't want to scare anyone. Um, a lot of good stuff between trauma-informed and, and um, cultural competency or sensitivity. Um, put it all in your toolkit, all in your toolkit. But thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. A hundred times, um, because again, program does not exist without you as a volunteer. <laughs>